and we see it. Okay, so let's just start the show with the Graham Fletcher. He's here to talk about a lot of things, how to present your own case in family court. So there are some people who can't afford lawyers and expensive legal fees. Um, Graham is going to talk about how you can avoid those fees and then present yourself to the court. Please listen to him carefully and I am hoping that his talk is going to help all of you. Um, more people coming, Graham, just I think see you one or two minutes. Let me see, yeah, I think uh, Graham you can start now. So I'm going to pass you on to him. Please welcome him and listen to him. He will help you how to go to the court without lawyers and present your own case. Please welcome Graham Fletcher. Hi there everybody and uh, good afternoon. My name is Graham Fletcher and I'm a divorce coach and McKenzie friend and I'm here to tell you some insights about how to present your own case in family courts against lawyers in case you're interested in that. Let's see if I can press the right button here to get to the next part of the slide. Excellent. So a brief, uh, brief bit about myself. Uh, I'm the divorced father of two children, 20 and 15 years old. And um, I successfully went through my divorce in family courts without a lawyer and came out with a positive outcome. Uh, a shared residency order for my children to live with me equal time and uh, a financial order I felt really quite positive about. Okay, And I did that all just learning by myself how to go through family courts and um, ever since then I've been passionate about sharing that knowledge with other people and I've helped hundreds of other people go through family courts. Uh, I have a positive shared parenting relationship with my ex-wife. I can sit down and have a meal with my kids and a coffee. I can arrange 24th birthday parties for my daughter, etc. And I'm really, really pleased that that's an outcome I was able to achieve for my family. So uh, that was one of the really founding things about um, my journey that's really important to me. Uh, when I went through family courts, I had a McKenzie friend help me and subsequently I reflected and really felt I had a lot of transferable skills from my working history that would help me provide a really good McKenzie friend service. So um, I, my working background is one of a qualified mentor, 20 years working with children as families as a play worker, a youth worker and uh, a mentor. And I really enjoy working with families in conflict situations and helping them reduce that conflict. I love helping people with mindset, positive mindset, and empowering people to understand what the process is. And I really find that that really helps my clients. I am the author of Eyes Wide Open, How to Present Your Own Case in Family Courts Against Lawyers. And that's a self-published book of mine, which you can come and buy in my stand later if you'd like to. And um, I wrote that because when I was going through a divorce, frantically searching on Amazon for a book that might help me, I couldn't find anything that just simply explained it nice and simply how family courts worked, nice and uh, concisely explained in a way that I could process at that time when there was lots of other emotions going on. So I decided I'd write a book that was nice and short and not too overwhelming that would explain the process in nice, simple, bite-sized chunks. And I've had two solicitors help me with the drafting of that book and revising it. And they've said that I have a kind of unique way of just describing how the process works. So hopefully um, I can share some of those insights with you. And I'm very proud of this, but I've got over 130 reviews online from my clients uh, that they've all left on um, public forums and uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. So I'm very proud of that. It's really important to me to you know, get some client feedback like that. So, uh, I'm going to cover briefly what a McKenzie friend is. Uh, a McKenzie friend is called so because there was two parents called McKenzie in a court battle, uh, I think it was in the 1970s, and one of them argued the case that they should have 
um, support in court when they couldn't afford a solicitor or a barrister. That was a test case that then went on to be enshrined in sort of courts that there's a role that people have access to, okay? But it's generally quite confusing, not many people understand why it's called McKenzie Friendly. But I've kind of come up with my 10 point definition of what a McKenzie Friend should do or what I provide for my clients. And this is in, in, uh, an excerpt from my book, but some of the key things are emotional support through the court process to really try and keep your emotions under control so that you can focus and understand the process. Helping people understand how family courts work is something I'm really passionate about. I think if you're going to go in front of a judge, you need to know how courts work, their limitations, and also the way that you can try and achieve positive outcomes, and there's a number of ways to do that. And again, positive mindset is a really important kind of aspect to what I kind of try to instill with people, okay? I'm not going to go through exclusively the whole kind of this, but uh, this can be read of in my book. And, um, you know, there's a, a, so if we go on to the next slide, oh, the direction. Um, I've come up with a roadmap of the family court experience to try and sort of uh, say to people, here's what to expect. So I don't uh, speak for people in family courts. Um, my clients stand up and speak for themselves, okay? It's a really important detail that the judges don't give me permission to speak for my clients. And emotional check-in is therefore really, really important. Um, and why is this? Because if you're gonna stand up in front of an authority figure for the first time in your life to talk about your family, it's gonna be really daunting. You probably have all sorts of associations like I'm on trial, You've got all these associations of watching the television in courts and you're going to feel really, really nervous. And actually, some of that, from a mindset point of view, is not very helpful. And actually, being able to view the family court process in a different way is really important. Could I ask for a show of hands in the audience, right? How many people in the room have made a presentation as part of work to a group of people? Excellent. There's lots of people who have done that. Okay, that is a great step if you're thinking of presenting your own case because you are making a presentation to a judge who has criteria upon which he's judging things. Okay, so if it's a child arrangements case, it's the welfare checklist, and if it's divorce finances, it's section 25 of the Marital Causes Act. So these are the criteria that the judge is judging upon and you have to make a presentation in your paperwork and verbally to the judge. And that's my way of kind of explaining because on this point here, understanding the criteria to assess cases, a lot of people don't understand this when they're going through the process. So they start making presentations that are to do with the wrong argument. You know, they're not focusing on what the judge wants to hear. and. Um, so I really help uh, my clients understand what's important and what's not important and what to react to and what not to react to. Um, so writing up position statements is when you're kind of writing your document to state what your position is on the day and what you want to achieve. So the clearer you can be, you're helping the judge out because you're giving the judge clarity on what the outcomes are that you want to achieve. And so a lot of what I do is out of court preparation and coaching to help people articulate clearly what their aspirations and aims are, both short term and long term. Um, a really key part of what I do as well is also supporting clients with out of court negotiations. Um, I spoke earlier about um, the feelings and emotions that are triggered when you go to court. You're in a, a courtroom setting, you might feel like, I'm on trial. You might have a persuasive solicitor or barrister come and talk to you and speak to you in a way that is quite convincing that you have to agree something outside the courtroom, okay? And that can be really pressurized for people who are feeling emotional about talking about their own family in court. And people really feel under pressure and emotional. So the great thing is I'm able to help people gather their emotions understand the situation and figure out how they want to deal with lawyers and barristers, okay? 
So one of the things that I kind of uh, talk about in my book is this idea of spot the difference. Being able to spot the difference between what a solicitor or barrister presents, whether it's true or not, or whether it might be a persuasion technique to try and convince you it's true before you go into the courtroom. Because if you agree something outside the courtroom, when you go inside to the court, you may present to the judge we come to an agreement, okay? So, being able to spot the difference is like a really important kind of idea when you're going through the experience as a litigant in person. And ultimately, you're going to have to be ready on your feet to present to a judge calmly. A Mackenzie friend can uh, prompt you to remember all the things that you wanted to say to the judge that you planned out in advance if you forget. So um, I'm there to quietly remind people, put notes in front of them to say, you did say beforehand, this is important for you to communicate to the judge. And um, so this is a roadmap of the kind of journey that my clients go through. I'm just going to have a drink of water here. And when I was writing this book, I tried to come up with a nice, simple key to break down the book and also the approach that I have. And I've got these lovely little simple emojis that when you're reading through the book, they clearly say this is a moment for you to pause, check in, and recognize whether your emotions are being influenced right now, okay? It could well be that if you're in a family court, um, and somebody's making allegations about you, that your emotions are triggered, and then you might get into an emotional reaction and say certain things, or you might write certain things. Um, and so being aware of your emotions throughout the process is really, really important, and having somebody who can calmly help you process that can really help you in key moments to just keep calm. And... Um, one of the things I've got here about who can influence you, um, there's different types of court hearings um, as I've kind of experienced. Um, I'm somebody who's not trained in family law at all, but I'm a very acute observer of what I observe. And what I've observed and I've found that my clients find really helpful is there's two different types of court hearings. Certain types of court hearings are based in consent, and they're called directions hearings and dispute resolution appointments. And when somebody in the disagreement doesn't agree, it goes on to a contested hearing, and the contested hearing is where the judge is going to listen to both sets of evidence and order the outcome on the two people that can agree. And understanding this is really, really important because when you're at a court hearing that's consent-based, in my experience, helping litigants in person, sometimes people are not made aware that they can say no. They think in their head, because they're in front of a judge, who's an authority figure, that it would be rude to say no to a judge, to disagree with the judge. But actually, you can say, I disagree with what the other side's saying. You can say, here's my reasons for disagreeing. And then the court has to decide what direction this dispute goes in, and it might go to a contested hearing where the judge will listen to both of you, and he will decide, or she will decide for the, the people in the dispute. So, this concept of who can influence you is really quite important. Solicitors, lawyers may influence you. A judge may speak to you, and it might feel like they're influencing you. If you go to a child arrangements hearing, the family court advisor from CAFCAS might influence you. So there's all these decision points that the litigant in person has to do to sit back and think, what do I think about this and what decision do I want to make? And as a McKenzie friend, I'm really disciplined to not make decisions for anybody. Even when somebody says, what do you think I should do? I kind of go, we're not going to see each other after this uh, hearing. You need to make a decision. I'm empowering you to understand your choices 
but everything lies with you in terms of how you understand um, how this can move forward for you. Um, this principle we've covered quite clearly. I'm very into giving information. Information is everything. So if you understand the process you're about to go through, you walk into a courtroom camera, you will engage in a court negotiations camera, and you're just generally going to make better quality decisions. So that's very much a part of uh, what I do. I've got a YouTube channel that's got over 10,000 views with three minute videos that explain family courts. I'm really into explaining to people at least that they have a choice and I think that's really important. And this other step here is something that I really like the idea of spot the difference. When we were kids we were always used to playing spot the difference with images and being able to tell the difference between this thing's missing. And I think it's a really good idea to be able to spot the difference in family courts. So here's a little example of what I might mean by that. In a family court, if there's a situation where the parents can't agree on child arrangements, um, the family court advisor will write a report. And the report will have two sections, and normally people misinterpret the, um, the two different sections. So there's one section that reports what both parents have said in the telephone interview, and I put emphasis on the word reports. And then the, the last section that summarizes gives recommendations. Okay, It's quite common for a litigant in person to read the section at the front which reports what somebody said and misinterpret that because the family court advisor has reported what one person said, that therefore the family court advisor believes what they said. If you then go to the second section of the recommendations, it may indicate that actually those allegations aren't believed or they're not believed to be fact and there needs to be some clarity on that. But often what happens with litigants in person, they read the allegations in the report section and they emotionally react. It blinds their judgment and they can't think straight. And so this is why being able to spot the difference is really, really important. If they can go to the section at the end and see the recommendations, those are the really important things that matter to the, the judge or the magistrates. And again, some of this is learning how to read legalese language and, and notice the influence of words. And just again, helping people to calmly read through a document to understand their first interpretation might not be the right interpretation. That they may go into a real emotional reaction about reading something reported, but the family court advisor might not be hugely concerned about it, and they might be recommending that the case moves on in a way that's actually supporting their aims. Okay? And um, within my book, there's about 10 spot the difference moments. Because I've been through lots of journeys helping people, uh, whether it's child arrangements cases or divorce finance cases, there's been key moments that have stood out to me that when my clients need feedback, they go, this was the thing that really turned the case around for me. And so I think it's really important to kind of share those as considerations to people, to empower people to understand, again, their choices, maybe see the opportunities for positive change. Um, you might pick up, I'm a very positive-minded person, and I think when I was talking to you about my journey earlier through family courts, at the time I went through it, I possibly struggled to see the positive end of the journey that, and destination I was getting to. But I really strongly believed in my heart that that's where I would get to. And that was really important to me. And when you go through divorce, you can quite often meet a lot of people who start negatively prophesizing, family courts do this to men. Family courts do this to women, or family courts are this and they're that, and it's quite alarmist, some of the language that you might encounter. There's a lot of people on the internet who are going to share negative stories about divorce, but how many people who have a positive experience of divorce are going to go start publicizing it all around the internet? Possibly not. So you need to be really careful to apply some filters to going on the internet and who you take advice from, you know. 
as some of those people may not have understood how family courts worked or might work. They might have misinterpreted things or there might have been unfortunate things in their situation. But again, those people aren't you. Your family's unique and you've got to tell the unique story in family court if you need to in order for perhaps a judge to make a decision for you. And um, so that these are kind of key things that I'm always encouraging people to adopt a mindset of. Maybe it's a mindset of I'm going to be an exception to the rule if you do believe some of the stereotypes about family court. But I, I, I do see a lot of really positive outcomes happening in family courts for the children involved in certain situations. And there's always going to be the complexities of some people are not going to be happy about the family court's decision because this is why they're in court, because there's a dispute. So it's a really kind of um, complex situation um, and uh, everything's going to be unique to each individual family. And um, what I would like to do, I'm quite happy to take any questions if people want to ask now, I need to have a drink. Um, but um, if anybody would like to ask me any questions, um, I want to stand for the rest of the day and tomorrow. I'm happy to talk about my book and anybody's personal situation and confidence. Um, I hope what I've kind of outlined to you is helpful, has made you think about family courts perhaps in a different way. And it might make you consider whether you can do this yourself, if somebody is to help you through this journey and to help you stand up and be confident. There's lots of people saying that they'd stood up and done presentations. When you do it about your own family, it's trail difficult because of the emotions involved, but you may well think, actually, I could kind of do this for my family and, uh, if I need to do it. And uh, I wish everybody all the best if they're going through that journey. And um, I think that will wrap it up there. Thanks very much. Hello? <laughs> Try again. I was just wondering if you felt that the judge and the barrister in your own personal trial were supportive of you standing up and defending yourself, or did you find that it was very difficult standing up, you know, and sort of arguing against a barrister? Um, it, was, it was fine, um, you know, without going into divulging too much about that private situation. Um, I had a Mackenzie friend help me. And, um, no, the, the, I didn't feel that, that um, it was in any way um, a negative for me. I achieved a positive outcome. So, to, to my mind, um, it's, very daunting. it's very daunting. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, and I help people with this every week, you know, to stand up for your own family is just a whole completely different kettle of fish. And it can perhaps just take one word from a barrister or a lawyer to prod something where you're like, well, you know, and, and so that, that can be the challenge. But again, if you're prepared and you accept that that's part of the process, that person's doing their job to try and achieve something for the other side, if you don't personalize it, then actually you can deal with it far better. You know, um, I don't know if you've heard the phrase uh, of solicitors and lawyers acting on someone's behalf. I like to say to my clients, here's a great little mindset tool. Just envisage they are actors. They've got the job that they've been given at the start of the day, they're trying to achieve it for their client, and they're just acting. So if they can perhaps take that and go, okay, it maybe just helps them process it differently so that they're kind of not getting emotionally charged or triggered by what's being presented. And then they can just calmly return back to the plan that they've hatched out on paper. Your Honour, everything's mapped out on paper. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Here's the criteria for the case, it's the welfare checklist, so this is what I'm focusing on. Um, quite often what happens is all so quickly that the amount of time that you're actually speaking is quite short. And so the, 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 
a lot of it's more about how you cope with the pressures, you know, and, and uh, you, the judge will give you an indication of whether or not they feel that some of the written paperwork is convincing them, or whether it has to be resolved at this final hearing where they'll, they'll make a decision for you and they'll order an outcome on you at the contested hearing. So it's not going to be for everybody, but for some people, they might go, well, you know, if it's saving myself lots and lots of legal fees, and I've got the right support to understand it, and I've got the right support in negotiations outside the courtroom, and you know, somebody supporting in court, and some people will kind of go, well, yeah, I can rise up to that challenge, and, and, and I, can, I can do that. So, does that help? Or? Okay. That wasn't me. <laughs> Thanks very much for listening anyway, and if, if anybody would like to come to my stand, I think I've got one last stand here, a uh, slide, oh, did I miss that one? Yeah, so if anybody wants to buy my book, uh, they can get the price of the book off the consultation next week with me, um, and um, you know, there's, uh, my fees and figures there, so you know, you can get the, the price of the book back, and it would make a, a really informed session. If you've read my book, we can have a fantastic in-depth conversation and we can plan out exactly how I can help you in a really nice, clear, dynamic way. So uh, I'm here all day tomorrow as well, and uh, you know, I look forward to uh, chatting to anybody. And uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>